chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release from them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the, in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he prepared that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to give him to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scorched Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it to, on him, and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a, with a, rod, with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in the homage to him. And they, and they had mocked him. They stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Lord, even as we reflect upon the final moments on earth, Lord, may, we, may you speak to us through your Holy Spirit. May our hearts be truly be touched by what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, before I start, I'd like to congratulate uh, Abro and Tabitha of their newborn, Eliza. Praise the Lord. And of course, their grandpa and grandma is down here. <laughs> I want to congratulate them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We are entering to the final stretch of uh, the Gospel of Mark series. Um, as we, as, uh, as we begin uh, this year on the Gospel of Mark, and we thank God we are coming near to the end, uh, I'd like to take on this final passage in Mark chapter 15, the suffering and eventually the death of Jesus Christ this week and next week. And um, of course, uh, Sean will uh, close up this whole series with uh, Mark chapter 16, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I will bear the cross and suffering and Sean will take the glory. <laughs> yeah, I really uh, truly uh, want to give thanks to the Lord uh, as we go through this whole series of Gospel of Mark. Uh, sometimes we can be so familiar with uh, the Gospel as we hear um, how Jesus, because of our sin, um, have died on the cross, suffered and died on the cross. He died and was buried, and on the third day, he rose again and was resurrected. As Christian, this is the very central of our faith, uh, the very gospel message for us that Jesus died, suffered and died for our sin, that he was hung on the cross, and on the third day, he rose again. Today and next week, we want to really examine go into the details of what exactly Jesus went through 
when we talk about his suffering and his pain. Just now I read for you Mark chapter 15, which recorded the very details of what Jesus went through before he went onto the cross. In Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 20 that I read, it recorded his suffering in the public, in the public trial, the humiliation by the people, especially before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea at that time. In the previous chapter, in Mark chapter 14, Mark described the betrayal of Jesus' disciple, especially for Judas who betrayed Jesus, being sold with a sil a silver coins and allowed the Roman soldier to come and arrest him. In this chapter, in chapter 15, we see the details of the trial when Jesus was brought before Pilate. When he was being brought before the Pilate with a wrongful conviction and suffering of Jesus as he was, as he was being led eventually through crucifixion. And Jesus was taken before the Sanhedrin, and this was the highest Jewish council of the first century. There were 71 members of Sanhedrin, and it was presided by the high priest. The Jewish leader had been trying to capture Jesus as you read through the Gospel of Mark. The Jewish leaders, the, 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 the scribes, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, all these Jewish leaders, religious leaders, have always wanted Jesus to die and to be arrested. And however, because at that time, Israel was under the Roman Empire, so they can't do anything. They can't touch Jesus. That's why they need to bring him before Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, which represents the Roman Empire. Pilate was a cruel and harsh governor, that he hated the Jews, that he provoked them by trying to desecrate the temple in Jerusalem. He also brutally cut down, put down several insurrections and protests by the Jews. So the Jews hated him. The Jews hated Pilate. However, because in this instance, they wanted to get rid of Jesus Christ. So, because of their desperation, wanting to get rid of Jesus, they came to Pilate to seek his approval for Jesus to be put to death. And they plotted to falsely accuse Jesus that he is going to put up a political uh, threat to the Roman soldier, to the Roman Empire, and also a false religious leader. So all these Jewish leaders falsely accuse Jesus of what he has done. As we reflect upon Jesus' suffering in the Gospel of Mark, he gives us an instruction, he instructs us about the nature of our salvation through Jesus Christ and how we can share in this suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me expound on three um, lessons that we can learn from this detailed description of Jesus' suffering in Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. Firstly, Jesus... Jesus' identity as the suffering king. As we look at in the verse 1, it says, very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they found Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. It is as if that Jesus was sent into a court. And when Jesus stood before Pilate, and Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest, 
accused him of many things. Here, Pilate is trying to find out what exactly Jesus has done wrong, that the Jewish leaders are so angry that they want to bring Jesus before him. Because he has been hearing a lot of things, what the Jewish, lead, what the Jewish leaders have been accusing him. And one of it that he claimed, Jesus had claimed to be the king of the Jews. That is why he asked the very question, are you the king of the Jews? As Jesus stood before Pilate, as, as he asked that very question, and Jesus made quite an a, a, a uncommon answer in a sense, that he neither confirms or denies that he is the king of the Jew. And he just simply said, you have said so. Jesus is indeed the king of the Jew. Jesus indeed is the king of the Jews. But more than that, he is king of all. King of all. And Pilate, hearing, hearing what Jesus has responded, and he, he asked, he, he said, Have you... Next slide. Have you no answer? Sorry. Have you no answer to make? You see how many charges they are bringing against you, but Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Jesus did not deny that he is the king of the Jews. In fact, as, as Pilate continued to question him, he kept silent. You see, being falsely accused, someone will always try to stand up, wanting to be correct, to get the person to, to, to correct uh, of his, of his um, uh, false accusation. When we are falsely accused, our very first natural response is to defend our own innocence. We are there to clear our name, our and to correct our accuser. But here, interestingly, Jesus offered no response. I believe when Jesus did not respond directly to Pilate, Jesus already had given an answer. He is certain of his identity, of who he is. He gave a very clear indication that he is and he, he, that he is indeed not just the king of the Jews, that he is the king of all. And he fulfilled what the Old Testament, especially the prophet, have prophesied, the coming Messiah and the Lamb of God. He came to take away the sin of the world, becoming the suffering king. Jesus knew his identity as the Messiah, the chosen one who come to save the, save the world. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah that has prophesied in the Old Testament. He knew he is the one whom God has chosen to send to save the fallen world. He came not with power. He came not with strength. He came to save the world through his suffering. Through the suffering on the cross, he brought forth triumph of God as the chosen servant king. He came to accomplish two things as prophesied in Isaiah 53. First, he take what is ours, which is our sin, and he gave us what is his, his righteousness. Isaiah 53, 5, 6 says, But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. 
and by his wound we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah writes that when the Messiah comes, he will be the one who will suffer for the sins of God's people. That he goes on in verse 7 as God's chosen suffering king. He says, he was oppressed. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah as the Messiah that was being prophesied. He knew that as the Messiah who was to come to save God's people, not through his strength, not through his power, but through his suffering, through his incarnation to be a human being. Jesus not only know that he is a Messiah, but he is also the Lamb of God. Last week, Joshua shared with us um, how uh, Abraham put uh, Isaac on the altar. I think we are reminded that Jesus himself laid down his life as the Lamb of God. He knew that his eventual purpose on earth is to suffer death for us. That is why he was willing to give up his life. That Jesus was innocent. He does not deserve death. Pilate knows that Jesus was innocent. We will see later on how he tried several times to try and not try to get Jesus off the hook. But the people demand it and Jesus willingly accepts it. In John chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus said to the disciple, as he speaks of his coming sufferings, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for the purpose I have come. He knew his purpose. Jesus knew that he will be the Lamb of God, to be sacrificed on the altar, to die for our sins. To this hour, ultimately, Jesus realized that and knew and understand that it is not the will of the people that is driving his death, but that it is the will of God and that he knows in order to accomplish that purpose of God in his incarnation, he must willingly suffer and die. Jesus, in remaining silent, uh, shows that he knows that he is both the Messiah and also the Lamb of God that is being prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament. He is the, he, he laid his life voluntarily, knowing his very purpose on earth. Jesus not only know his identity as the Messiah and the Lamb of God, Jesus also obey God even to the point of death. Verse 6, he says, Now at the feast, he used to, re uh, he means Pilate, used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas, and, he, and the crowd came out and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. Pilate here 
it described that he is convinced of Jesus' innocence. Jesus was innocent. Pilate know very well. However, rather than making a, a decision with his authority to release Jesus, he tries to appease the crowd. He tries to appease the crowd several times and asking them who they want to release. Mark recorded for us that Pilate has established a practice during the Passover to release a prisoner among, uh, back to the people as a kind show, show of his good faith for the people. And the prisoner that he chosen is Barabbas. Actually, it, it is a play of words if we, if we go back to the original Greek language in this whole incident. Among the rebels who had committed murder in the resurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. Now, Mark gives us the account of Barabbas. The account is truly loaded with irony. And as, he, uh, as we see that actually Barabbas' first name is called Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. And when, G when Pilate brought out Barabbas, two men were standing in front of him. Jesus, Barabbas, and Jesus of Nazareth. Barabbas was guilty and convicted. And in fact, the, the real me the meaning of Barabbas is the son of the father. And again, Barabbas, the fake son of the father, the human son of the father, and standing before the true son of the father. Two persons standing before Pilate, and he asked the question, who shall I release? And the, the Jews continue to ask, Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas, the fake son of the father, to be released. And they want to crucify Jesus, the Nazareth, the true son of the father. The chief priest and this is caused by the chief priests, the Jewish leaders. In verse 11, it says, The chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him, Pilate, to release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said, Then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jew? And they cried out again, Crucify him. This is an enactment, not only at that point of time, but it is a true reflection of our, of, of our human nature, the humanity who did not want the true Son of the Father, Jesus the Nazareth. And like the crowd, we wanted a different Jesus. A Jesus that they could live with. A Jesus who would not make them feel guilty. A Jesus of this world. The world has been crying out for a different Jesus. One that is more like us. In recording this event, Mark, I believe, wants his reader to see the sinful tendency within all of us as we reject the true Son of God, Son of Father. Rejecting Jesus Christ in favour of a different Jesus who better suits of our sinful desires. Part Pilate was so puzzled. Jesus, the innocent one, have to be crucified. The Jews, the Jewish leaders, 
were truly wanting to get Jesus. And he asked, what evil has Jesus done? He can't believe it that he was so stunned by the crowd's response to crucify Jesus. Verse 14, Pilate says, Why? What evil has Jesus done? But they shouted out all the more. It just stirred out the Jewish leaders all the more, wanting Jesus to be crucified. Instead of standing up with his authority as the governor, Pilate gave in to the people. He gave in to the Jewish leaders and put Jesus to be crucified. And this is the final irony. Mark's telling Jesus who was innocent but declared guilty and Barabbas who was guilty was set free. Jesus, the innocent son of the father, dies in the place of the guilty son of the father. I believe that the story of Barabbas here illustrates an important theological point that many, that the innocent, uh, that the innocent Son of God came to die in the place of sinners, a substitute who stands in the place of others, assuming the responsibility of the sinful nature that we bear. So when we talk about Jesus here dying in our place, He is our substitute. He is the Lamb who was slain. And this is what we mean, that Jesus came not only as a suffering servant for sin, but He comes as a substitute for sinners. Someone who stands in the place of punishment and assume their guilt. Hebrews 2.9 he says, we see him, Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. He was crowned the glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He died for you and me. Jesus offered himself willingly, voluntarily, not only for Barnabas, but for all who have sinned. The penalty of our sin and the punishment of our, si of, of, of our sin is death. It should be us that should be crucified on the cross. But Jesus takes it upon himself. Jesus becomes the substitute for us as he put himself to suffer and to die for us. So in a way, me and you are Barabbas in this story. Though we are guilty of sin, we can be set free because the righteous one has taken our place as our substitute. And this is the very essence of salvation. Jesus, the innocent, righteous Son of God, stands in the place and we see that He has done so for all of our salvation. And the third lesson that we learn that Jesus, our hope, our Saviour, our salvation will eventually gain victory in our suffering. What did the suffering of Jesus accomplish? In verse 16 to 20 of Mark chapter 15, one thing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldier led Jesus away into the palace that is Petronum, 
and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple rope on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Mark records for us the pain that Jesus go through, the humiliation by the Roman soldier as they treated him as a fake king of Jews. They try to humiliate him, spit on him, hit him, put a crown of a crown of thorns upon him. It reminds the ugliness of sin, the ugliness of our own sin. What Jesus have to go through. How so often we treat sin so lightly, so thoughtlessly. But when we are confronted by the suffering and the ultimate crucifixion of Jesus Christ because of sin, we are not able to regret, regard our sin with anything less than with utmost seriousness. Jesus' suffering revealed to us the ugliness and the severity of the sin of our sin that require Jesus to go through the pain and suffering. It caused Jesus not only the humiliation, but eventually death on the cross. He did not do it for his own. He do it because. He loves you and He loves me. Hebrews 12 says, Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before Him. How can the cross be joy? It can only be joy not in its experience, but in its outcome, the salvation of all mankind. The suffering of Jesus was not without purpose. It is not without meaning. Ultimately, the suffering and the death of Jesus would result in his glorification and in the salvation of all sinners. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 says, Jesus, being found in the human form, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God was highly exalt, has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And this is the beautiful irony of the moment, that in the midst of suffering, in the midst of being humiliated by the soldiers, and they mockingly worship Jesus. They worship Jesus as the king. When they bow their knees, they, they heal him as Lord. And when they are doing, what they are doing is that they are unknowingly pointing the victory that he has secured. The suffering of Jesus provides for sinners the hope of salvation and the suffering of Jesus will also be the means of his victory. We see that in the moment Jesus is suffering and ultimately his death on the cross will accomplish more than any sacrifice that could be made and any law that can be followed. Jesus wants us to have this hope, to have this hope for salvation through the suffering and the death of our Lord and Saviour, our King hung 
on the cross. Let me close with some application as we, as we go through the details and the three lessons that we can learn that Jesus recognized himself as the Messiah and the Lamb of God. And Jesus willingly suffered for us, making himself at the, as the sacrifice. And lastly, it is for our salvation, for our hope that Jesus suffered and gained the ultimate victory. Let me just share three applications. How does this apply for us in our life? Jesus suffered for our sin. Jesus suffered for our sin. This is what Isaiah says in Isaiah, in Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgression, for our sin. He was being crushed for our iniquities. That Jesus bore the punishment that he doesn't deserve. He bore the punishment because of us. And so in the suffering of Jesus, we see both the cost of our sin and the depth of God's love that Jesus was forsaken by God so that we would never have to face the judgment. Jesus took the brunt of what we're supposed to face. But more than that, Jesus suffered for our salvation. He did not only suffer for our sin, He suffered for our victory, our salvation from our sin. The only way for us to have our sin forgiven and to draw close to God is to surrender and to believe in Jesus Christ. Some of us here may have never made that choice or say that prayer. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Today, it could be God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you through the Holy Spirit to see what He went through of His suffering to die for your sin. May I invite you later on as we close, may I invite you to come forward. Come forward to receive this precious gift that God has given to all of us, the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can ne never learn, earn our way, our own way to be reconciled with God. It is only through Jesus Christ and what He has done, what He has went through, the suffering, the pain, and eventually His death, that we can be reconciled with God. We can never earn our salvation. But because of Jesus' love and because of what He has done on the cross, when we put our faith in Him, when we surrender our life to Him, that we can draw close back to God because He is the ultimate Lamb of God, that He has done the work to reconcile us back to Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake He made Him to be seen who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus suffered for our sin. Jesus suffered for our salvation. Today is the day. Some of us may have been with us for quite some time. But ask the question, have you made that decision? Have you come before our Lord Jesus Christ said, Lord Jesus, today I want to believe in you. Forgive my sin. Today is the day that he brings salvation for us. Jesus suffered Second, next application. Jesus suffered so that you and I would turn 
to him in our suffering. Hebrews 4.16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. As we went through Mark chapter 15, 1 to 20, we can see that Jesus has suffered just as you and I have been through. But he suffered more as an innocent man, as a son of God. He knew what you go through. Some of us this afternoon, sitting there, you may be going through some tough times because Suffering is something that we have to face, whether we are believers or non-believers. Every one of us. You may be struggling in your very own personal life. But Jesus said and demonstrated to us that He understands you. He understands what you are going through. He understands what you are going through. And he wants to stretch out his hand to invite you to come to him and lay what is in your heart. The suffering, the pain, the struggle. Because when only we can come to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that we can find hope, that we can find victory. Jesus went through suffering for us, for you, for me. So that he come and tell us that he understands what you go through. And he wants, he invites you to come and lay it before him at the cross. This afternoon, God is speaking to you. Come, come unto me and I will give you peace, and I will give you rest. Not that He will take away those suffering, but He will give you the strength and the faith and the victory over all those suffering, that you will see that who is the real Lord and Saviour, who is the real King in your life. May I invite the worship team to come? As we enter into time to worship our God, I also want to invite anyone that the Lord may be speaking to you to surrender your life to Him, to surrender your trouble to Him, to surrender your suffering to Him. You want to live all those things out of your life. Not that He will erase it, but He will bear the burden for you. That He wants to walk beside you and come into your life.
Lord, we want to give thanks for the work that you've done, the suffering that you went through, the pain that you, you've gone through for all of us. Lord, we just want to give thanks. The seriousness of sin, the Lord, that you put yourself to the cross to die for us. Lord, we want to give thanks, O Lord, for all who have received you as our personal Saviour and Lord. And this afternoon that we can say, Lord, you are truly our Lord and Saviour. We just want to give thanks to you, O Lord, once again. As we share in your suffering that you've given to us, Lord, may we live our life to the fullest to glorify your name. Use us, O Lord, as a mouthpiece to bring glory to your name and to spread the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ to many who have yet to know you and hear you. We commit ourselves unto your loving hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.